What's up and welcome to another episode of the Scott and Ian show on the SBL podcast. Hey, how do you feel about signature bases? Has it changed for you over time? I mean, I remember one of the first amazing instruments I owned was a Billy Sheehan Attitude Limited One in lightning blue made in 1991, I believe, by Yamaha. I also had the Brian Bromberg bass made by PV. It was called a B quad four man. Holler at me. If anybody remembers that, that was more like mid to late nineties, maybe 95 ish. I would say, um, ah, you know, and then as I got older, I didn't want to have a signature bass. I wanted to have my own thing. Like I didn't want to buy the flea bass, nothing against flea. I love flea, but I didn't want his bass. I wanted something of my own. And this is something that I've really struggled to navigate as my career has gone on and I've been offered signature deals. Um, I have a signature bass with Vorin Saku, although, you know, it's not... He's not making very many of them, uh, and you can still order a variety of features on it. Uh, And I love that instrument. I love it so much. And um, (laughs) also, I don't know if you've seen, but I did a collaboration with uh, Spencer Lull from Mike Lull, and we made a bass called the IMA4. And listen, this is crazy because I knew that was going down when we did this interview, but I was really not interview when Scott and I did this podcast, right? But I wasn't sure what we were going to call the instrument. It hadn't been announced yet. And I was really on this kick am on this kick of like, I don't want to have big branding on it. I don't want to have like a hat and glasses on the back of the headstock of a bass, right? Because I don't know that anybody really wants that from me. I want an instrument that I help design that is uh, really cool and versatile and amazing with features that are really intentional that you're going to like. So I have this just, you know, and (sighs) I have these struggles with this truly. Uh, and then, you know, Scott talks about he's, he's had signature offers as well. He's had a signature base. So we talk about the struggle between like, yeah, signature bases are cool. There was a time when they were so cool and happening. Are they, is it over? Is it over? I don't know. How do you feel? How do we feel? You're about to find out. Listen, here's what's up at SBL this week. Let me tell you, we've got an upcoming mentor session Monday, July 3rd with the legendary Jacob Umansky. If you don't know Jacob, he's an unbelievable player. Uh, He plays in a band called Intervals, Canadian sort of like metal, instrumental tech metal band. They're so good. Melodic tech metal, I'm going to say, though, because you can sing these melodies. Aaron Marshall, shout out to you, man. I love your guitar playing. I love Intervals so much he is a guy who can do it all he's he's playing with fingers he's smashing he's pulling through the string he's thumping he's going down up with his thumb like parallel thumb he's playing like flea sometimes he can do all the stuff and he's going to be talking to you on monday july 3rd hope i got that date right again monday july 3rd about how to thump it's awesome if you're not a part of sbl check it out. It's the best place to learn how to play the bass. It's incredible. We've got sessions every Monday with players like Jacob Umansky, where you can ask questions. You can directly interface with the players that you admire, like Jacob. Amazing. Also, we've got the Jazz Accelerator open for one week right now. So if you want to learn how to walk the bass, you want to learn how to play along to standards, play chords, play melodies, navigate those tricky jazz chords. What's the seven mean? It's open for enrollment for one week check it out and with that said i'm going to get into this podcast episode me and scott talking about our signature bases over let me take a little sip of agua dude a little sip it's good to see you oh fucking dude hit the lacroix dude come on (laughs) (laughs) well listen listen. i have no idea what lacroix is but i just love it when you're like it's a LaCroix. <laughs> like, you don't have LaCroix. LaCroix over there? You don't, don't have it? I don't think so. It's just sparkling water with with a tiny bit of flavor. And the flavor is like really diminished. It's just like <clears throat> essence of. So it's like, like you know, someone was standing, like when they made the, the, the key lime LaCroix, limes were in an adjacent building. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's sort of the vibe. But I yeah, love it. Yeah. The uh, the uh, bubbles are aggressive. It's like real. It's like ouchy kind of, and I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, burned yeah. my face. Ah! <laughs> uh, do you guys have Topo Chico over there? I don't think so. We got Dr Pepper, dude. Hey, but <laughs> we've got we've got we've got Iron Brew. What else do you want in life? Brew. 
I love an iron brew. I have drank I, that when I was in Scotland. Have oh. I told you? Have I told you about? Yeah, iron brew. For anybody that doesn't know, it's like the signature drink of Scotland, or it used to be back in the day. Right? <laughs> I can remember when I was a kid. I used to live like five miles from the Scottish border. There was a lot of iron brew in my town. Honestly, it was awesome. Uh, have I ever told you about Lisa when we got married? The iron Tell brew me. incident. Please tell me. Okay, so as, you know, most, you know, sort of like, actually, I'm just sort of like, you know, grossly just sort of like painting everybody with the same brush here. But, yeah. you know, Lisa had, like like many, many women, had, had dreamed about her wedding day, fantasized about it as a child, you know, when she got that one day in life where she got to, you know, <laughs> dress up with a wedding dress yes. and the whole thing, and then the... You know, the the carriage will come along or, or the <laughs> yeah, yeah, limousine yeah. Or, or whatever, you know, he's going to pick her up and take her to the church and we're going to get married, all of that stuff, right? Yes. Well, by the way, if anybody can hear some drilling in the background, I do apologize. <laughs> there is a guy <laughs> drilling over the fence next to my house and I, I have asked him, I was like, how long is it going to go on to, for today? And he was like, all day. So <laughs> I'm having to put up with it. You guys are going to have to put up with it as well. Okay. So now I've got that out of the way. It's just okay. Fine. Awesome. So Lisa dreamed about her wedding day as many people have dreamed about their wedding day. And it just so happened that we had no freaking money when we were getting married. And the whole deal was like, okay, we need to get married on a shoestring. So we were like, so we were like, huh, sh- should we have flowers? No no flowers huh. should we have like a meal like at the wedding no we had hot dog sausages like we oh, went i love it i love yeah, it dude it wow. was awesome actually it actually went down as sort of like one of the best weddings that i've been like oh i know i'm biased and stuff but it was wild and it was, <laughs> it was funny. a good time everybody had oh. an amazing time we stripped out all of the shit that you don't need and we had all of the awesome stuff in there that ever that we yes. did need yeah it was I it was it. awesome and then when lisa Obviously, I didn't see her on the day um, because we were doing it on a shoestring budget. We were like, oh, what's going to take you to, you know, it was the Leeds Town Hall where we were getting married. What's going to take you to Leeds Town Hall? We can't afford a, obviously, the, well, the carriage, get out of here, right? We can't afford like a limo or anything like that. And Lisa's like, oh, I'll get a black taxi, like a London cab, because that's pretty cool, right? It's going to cost yeah. us 10 quid to get... <laughs> 10 quid to get to the uh, where we're getting married and and it's going to be in this awesome cool black cab very awesome i was like yeah sounds like a plan right well so there's sort of like there's a knock at the door you know she's there in a dress and stuff like that with her mom ready to go down to town so she like <laughs> opens the door and the taxi driver's like hey i'm just coming to pick you up she's like wicked she like stands out steps outside the house and the the taxi the it, it is a black taxi, yes. but it's been wrapped. It's got a graphic wrap, and it no. is covered in it's. It's a massive iron brew can. <laughs> <laughs> It is not. It is a massive <laughs> iron brew can. So she has to. So she she gets into this like freaking like taxi size iron oh. brew can and gets driven down to town. It was awesome. It was oh. yeah. We, now, we've okay, la- we okay. laugh about it all the time. How did was Lisa upset? Did she realize the comedy in the moment? Was she? Oh, yeah. Was no, she? She's a rock star, dude. She was. Oh, she was dude, howling. That's so much. cool. She, she was like, you this know. is yeah. It's better than a black cab. Because, like, who gives a shit about a black cab? You can't talk about a black cab, like, you know, almost 20 years after the fact, but you can freaking talk about a giant iron brew Dude, cab. That, that's a great point. <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah, it makes an amazing story. I feel like in the moment, though, there might be some groomzillas that would have none of that. Or oh, some maybe, bridezillas, yeah, yeah, dude. Yeah. I, you know, everybody talks about bridezillas, but come on, dude. There's some groomzillas out there. They'll be like, oh, I thought this was supposed to be a, you know, get that thing out of here we can't it's our wedding it's my <laughs> wedding you know but you guys yeah, rolled. Yeah. we rolled I love it it. it was awesome um, do you know what iron brew tastes like dude, because i do dude at one point that shit was running through my veins <laughs> it was like i was sponsored by iron brew <laughs> can i tell you what yeah. i think it tastes like <clears throat> oh god i go think it, it yeah. tastes like a combo of coca-cola and blood <laughs> do you know the sort of like do you know the sort of like the the iron taste of your blood you yes. know 
it's that. It it reminds me of drinking Coca-Cola with slightly maybe like less sugar or something and like a teaspoon of blood. Well, yeah, I'm looking at it now. It says it tastes like orange and black currant to many people. Orange hmm. and black currant, what a mix maybe, but others have described it as fizzy bubblegum. Oh, or even a gum. sweetened version version of Listerine. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Like maybe kind of, it's, maybe kind of. since it's called iron, I, <clears throat> I I'm like making that up. But I remember tasting. You know, like when you bite your tongue or or yeah. something, and you get that yeah. sort of me- metal taste. It was that to me, dude. It tastes like blood. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. It's weird. Iron brew, haggis, and black pudding. Oh, oh yeah. hell yeah, That's dude! I had black about. pudding every morning at uni at uh, in Edinburgh. Every morning. Every oh, morning. I, oh, yeah, dude, I love every it. morning. Eggs, black pudding. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Lacroix is nothing like Iron Brew, Scott. Lacroix is just bubbly water. There's no sugar. There's Ugh. a tiny little hint of flavor. Ugh, but it's yuck. the thing that I Thank had to move to. <laughs> I know, dude. But it's the thing that I had to move to. Like I was addicted to Diet Coke, and it's a thing that I feel like you know everybody over in the states, at least my age or whatever, our age, sort of when they started to give up, it was like, oh, like artificial sweeteners are like terrible for you. Yeah, Everybody yeah. sort of like transitioned over to LaCroix. I yeah. will say that I had a a, doc, a can of Dr. Pepper. I, <laughs> yeah. uh, full was, sugar, dude. Just full out. sugar Dr. Check this Pepper. Out. It must have, it's maybe the first uh, like fizzy drink I've had in um, two three years maybe more because yeah. i don't yeah. drink it anymore same as you right yeah. but but i but i did it like a criminal it was hidden <laughs> in the back of my i can remember like one of the kids were asking me right oh can i have this kind of doctor i was like yeah whatever so i bought them it knowing that they would just forget about it yes because they never have it either so i got it i shoved it in the back of the fridge and it's oh, been yeah, there did. it's been there for months and then just the the other day, I can't remember what I'd eaten, but it was somewhat dirty. It was yeah, like a yeah. fish and chips or something oh, horrible oh, like yeah. that, right? Yes. And it was on maybe it was like a massive pizza or something. <laughs> and I, I had all the grease on my face. And You're like, like, why not just keep going? Yeah, I'm just like, I'm going in. So like nobody was looking. I grabbed that Dr yeah. Pepper out the fridge, and then I went in the side <laughs> room. Yeah, side room. I went in the side room off the kitchen slowly pushed the door to the kids kids and Lisa oh my God, watching dude. a film and I went oh my God. and I freaking necked that thing in about 30 seconds and it was the freaking best thing I've drank in years it was awesome oh just I'd feel that like sugar pour it onto my face like ah. <laughs> It was awesome. <laughs> Dude, that makes me that makes me wonder, do you ever hide I'm sorry to take this to like a dark uh like <laughs> eating eating world <laughs> thing here but do you hide food ever from your i mean you did that one oh, do you do you do that uh, sometimes we're yeah, like uh, i've got very strange eating habits like yeah level eight like level eight eating habits <gasps> wow. level eight and it all stems from um well it stems from fundamentally and foundationally i am sort of like have got a very odd weird per, like addictive personality but yes. like I have, I have compulsions to to repeat behaviors that, yes. that's what i'll say about i've got like compulsions to repeat behaviors and that runs, that shit runs deep it, <laughs> it is runs like deep yeah i find it really and it can be anything it's yeah. if anybody's like what are you talking about it can be it can be eating it can be doing the same thing every day at the same mm-hmm. time like it's je- like it's and it's weird it's weird shit and and i do it and and what it generally happens i might have talked about it before on the pod but generally if it'll be all around sort of like one or two things every day yeah. it's not like a lot of different but it's always like one or two things that i'll just repeat every single day so at the minute it is um, every morning I'll go down and I'll get an iced coffee from the supermarket that's just like five minutes up here. Every morning. Yeah. Every morning. Is it, is like it because if anybody, like if anybody tries to get in, in the way of me uh, doing that, yes. it's, it's the repeated behavior. I'm like addicted uh, to the repeated behavior. So here's the interesting thing. If mm. I stop doing it, which I have before, it will crop up somewhere else. 
I will have some other yes. weird bit of repeated Old. behavior. Yeah. Right. It's like I just need to have this sort of like repetition. It's really odd. Anyway, so to your point or your question, yeah, I have got like so with eating and the eating thing, I was totally fine. And then I and, and then years ago, I got this thing called candida, which is this fungus that grows in your lower intestine. Mm-hmm. And I had to um, I had to go on a, a diet of no sugar for, and I did I didn't eat any sugar or any gluten for seven months, oh, nothing. Yes. Right? Yep. And yep. If you have not tried that before, somebody might be listening to that, but like no sugar, no gluten, easy, no problem. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, it's like really hard. Yes. Every like I can remember being out, I'd be like, you know, I'd go out on a day trip or something like that. If I didn't take food with me, it was Couldn't almost it. impossible to eat. Yes. yes. Like I was like trying to run over Oh, and by the way, I didn't have any fruit either. No fruit. So it's like oh, it's a really partic- yeah, it's a really particular diet. So no fruit, no gluten, no sugar. Good luck. No fun. No fun. Anyway, so <laughs> actually, side note, I've never felt healthier in my life. It was amazing. Right. So yes. ever since then, I've been kind of sort of like slightly obsessed with kind of like experimenting with diet and stuff like that. And I kind yeah. of like, so, and, and, and you know, and that sort of like weirdly ties into this sort of like weird compulsion that I have to, to do repeated things in the daytime. Anyway, so I have gone through various, um, I guess, sort of, uh, periods over the last few years of just eating meat like nothing but meat uh and it's it's called the carnivore diet so just eat i'll eat chicken every single day every single meal or i'll eat steak every single day every single meal And, and when i do it i feel amazing like amazing i don't have any sort of like issues of like indigestion or so like it's it's actually like a weird superpower that i've found because if i ever feel sort of um i guess sort of I guess I'm like sluggish or brain fog or I'm getting sort yeah. of like weird indigestion. I'm just sort of like, okay, I'm just going to eat meat for 30 days and it just completely cleans out my system. Wow. And wow. I go back. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like a superpower that I accidentally found. It's amazing. But here's the, re- the but the issue is when I fall off, when I fall back to, to the sort of like the regular, <laughs> yes. that is when sort of like, I will like, so, for instance, I know I, I gorge. Basically, I'll gorge. I can remember yeah. sort of like I've got like a, 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 a the the moment that I fell off that seven month that seven month sort of like sugar gluten free and fruit free you know yeah. stint, which is seven months. I can remember the 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 moment, the minute I fell off the wagon, I went into a cupboard and I got this chocolate bar. And I freaking ate the entire thing yes. in under a minute, like a right. massive <laughs> chocolate bar. I was like, <laughs> you know I mean, it was like, like it was like yeah, 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 probably yeah. like smeared on my face, and it's sort of like it's, it's like it's a it's a bloodbath. It's a yes, bloodbath. Yes. Yes. So it's never been as bad, but I have got little things like that. So, for instance, I have got a chocolate bar hidden in my bedside cabinet at the minute. Incredible. Yeah, it's hidden in there, but I haven't eaten it. It's been there for. It's been there for like, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks or something like that. But it's when it goes down, <laughs> but when it goes yes. down, it's going to be brutal. It will go, it'll be gone in a minute. I'll feel guilty. So I'm not even sure what the question was, but yeah, I've got weird shit going on, dude. I'm just oh, like- <laughs> man. Uh, yeah. Well, and I, I do too. I have a horrible, horrible habit of eating at night. And I'm talking, like I was telling some friends about this last night. I played a gig last night. It was so, so much fun, fun yeah. to see some friends. And I was talking because I started to do this thing. I wanted to tell you about this. I started to do this thing yesterday uh, as a result of I have been eating for three years, like COVID on indiscriminately. Usually I have some discretion about what I eat and I'm very like, ah, I'm not very quote unquote good, but I think about it yeah. in the last three years. I haven't really thought about it. I've just had whatever. And I struggle, man. Everybody goes to bed. I stay up, dude. I stay up. I'm watching YouTube videos. I'm playing a little bass and then I eat. And I probably, <laughs> if I'm honest and I'm not trying to be like socially like, no, it's not that bad. I probably eat 2000 calories just at night. And that's not, what is that? That's I not, I'm, I'm, just, I'm rubbish with calories. Like, what is it? Two th- oh, 2,000 calories is supposed to be like your daily, your is daily like intake. It's chocolate and crisps. Dude, it's, and- it's every, yes, it's chocolate. It's crisps. It's like handfuls of chocolate <laughs> chips from the pantry. Dude, it's a bowl of cereal. It's another bowl of cereal. 
Oh, yeah. It's, yeah dude, yeah. I, I fully, so I eat a day's worth of calories in that time. And it's not a substitution. I mean, I've been eating all day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. probably eat two, 3,000 calories. So I bet I've had a day and a half's worth of food. No, 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 I'm sorry. Two and a half days worth of food in one day. And I go to bed and I feel like super full. And I kind of got used to liking that feeling of feeling like really full but then i would have horrible indigestion and wake up and dude fuck it's been horrible but it is compulsion and it is addiction i think and so is oh it an addiction God, to the behavior is it like repeated behavior or is it an addiction to sugar is sugar always a part of it, is it not, or does it not sugar is always a part of it sugar is always a part of it but it's also the behavior oh dude everybody goes to bed it's me time baby oh it's 10 p.m oh i'm gonna stay up till one dude and i'm gonna like watch stuff and eat and it's gonna be awesome and then i just it just fucks me over it's horrible so yesterday scott i started it's so dumb it's so dumb do you guys have chipotle over in the uk oh yeah yeah I was like, I told my wife, I was like, I'm going on the Chipotle diet. She's like, what is that? I'm like, I'm going to eat one meal a day and that's it. So I went to Chipotle yesterday and I bought a bowl, you know, like, you know, and I, <laughs> I just filled it full of all the things yeah. that I would get at Chipotle and I ate it. And that's all I've had now since 1 p.m. yesterday. And how are you feeling? I feel like shit. <laughs> oh, dude, if you can keep that up, it'll change your life. It'll be amazing. Really? Yeah. It'll be amazing, uh, dude. Yeah. I mean... I got real hungry. I played that gig. Everybody got burgers and fries, dude, and like milkshakes at this gig. It was like dude, good food. It'll be and I didn't eat anything. Changing. It'll uh, be life changing. So, so I'm hungry right now, Scott. <laughs> it, honestly, it is a massive superpower. Like, it, it's it's a superpower. To what find, is? Yeah, the Chipotle Ch- diet. <laughs> Maybe not the Chipotle diet, but yeah. but 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 like figuring out how to impact your day-to-day yeah sort of feeling like how you feel the day-to-day and and using diet to do that like, it's a superpower because i it's, know like, because yeah i sort of like get these iced coffees every day yeah i've got these weird compulsions sort of like behaviors and stuff yeah i've got like a chocolate bar in, a, in my bedside cabinet I had it there for eight weeks and i sort of like yeah. drank a dr pepper in the side room the other day <laughs> but saying all of that i yeah. do like have like a i actually do like not eat like carbs very rarely like very very yeah. like maybe a day a week i'll mm-hmm. eat some carbs um other than that it's just like all protein and and it's just like i really suffered from sort of like a lot of weird sort of like stomach gut stuff yeah shit yeah just like way too young it was as i just turned like just over 30 now that went on for a long time it went on yeah. i think until Maybe I was like 35. And actually, it started, I think, late 20s to about 35. And I was like, what is going on? And yeah. then I found out that I had this candida, which is a massive mm. fungus growth in your lower intestine. And 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 I got this book um, by this – it was – the author was called Eric or something. And, dude, it was um, – well, just to put it out there, that this the woman that wrote the book was in a freaking wheelchair when she was in her sixties, and it turned out it was caused by candida, which was wow. a fungus diet. Yeah, 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 and it's really hard to test because mm-hmm. it's in your lower intestine. So, um, and she um, ended up, she like basically got out of the wheelchair. She also went to university, I think, or something like that in her late sixties. Yeah. She felt like she'd suffered her entire life and then wrote this book and became incredibly successful and all of that good stuff way late in life. And, um, and in the book, he said, Hey, you know, if you have got candida, like a telltale sign of, um, of what's called die off is when you strip out all of you know all of the sugars out of your diet and i went a little further and added gluten in there as well but no sugar so no like literally no sugar not even right. natural sugars like that are in um, in fruits when you strip them out you you might he said you might suffer this thing called die off where you feel like you know like aches and pains and stuff yes. like that. i was like okay okay i'm, I'm ready for this die off i could but I was having the most weird, intense pains in my legs and my, the lower part of my body for about wow. two weeks. And oh, I mean, I, have- I mean, like 
crazy intense. I've got some leg pain right now. <laughs> Maybe I'm experiencing some die Oh my die-off. god, that may be. Like, try it out. Like, honestly, it wow. was crazy. Yeah. And it was yeah. to the point where I couldn't function. Maybe for like a week, a week mm. and a half. Okay. regularly i was like it got to the point where the pains in my legs i'd sit still it'd be fine and then if i move my leg it would be like somebody injecting like oh. a shit ton of lactic acid into my muscles and my legs it was oh, crazy wow. anyway it was die off that's what i was wow. experiencing Exper- and it nearly went on for two weeks or something bonkers oh like that and then and ever since then i kind of were like i was like oh wow you're like your diet really really makes a difference to how you feel yeah. like it really does and once you've once you've uh, experienced it, it's like there is no going back. You can fall off the wagon and all that kind of shit, but there is, you know, that there is a button that you can press I know. and it can actually, it can reset a lot of stuff. And but the hit- problem, dude, is for me, there is going back because I did this. I did, oh God, I did a few years of like no gluten and sugar. I was so, oh dude, I looked good, man. Did I it felt feel good. good. I felt great. And then you know what? The addiction, it, I, man, the addiction to the repetition and the sugar, whatever. It creeps back in, and I went, dude, I fell off hard. I fell off hard. And then the pandemic, and I'm bummed out, and, oh, it's the perfect storm. So I know what I need to do. I just sometimes am too pathological to do it, to push the button. I don't want to fucking push the button. You You know, because eating sugar is fun. Dude, eating eating, uh, living longer is even funner, though. I know, but I want to eat boost bars and chips in the studio with you guys. So I know, UK- I know. <laughs> I mean, Maybe we just yeah, go all this protein and shit. I've seen you house bags of crisps and oh, yeah. just chocolate bars in the studio, dude. That's what I was going to say. And- Maybe we go all out in the studio, and then after that, we just go into sort of like recovery mode, just strip yeah. it out. I'm up for that. I'm in the studio okay. next week. I'm going to eat some crap. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Anyway, it's legit, anyway. Though, isn't it? I think honestly yeah. though, I think it's uh it is a super and what I was gonna say is I find like knowing that sort of like I can have such a detrimental effect on on my sort of like day to day by using diet, I find it just absolutely almost like unbelievable that whenever any of my friends are ill or anything like that, when they go to the doctors, the doctors never say what is your diet like? Like is this the most ludicrous thing that you've ever, like, it's, it's, it is strange. Fucking stupidity. Like I've had this friend, he's suffering from fri- uh, like fi- fibromyalgia and, uh, and he has all of these weird symptoms. It's been going on for years. I'm like, dude, has anybody talked to you about experimenting with diet? Nothing. Not no. one specialist he's been to through like, the last two make money. or three years has mentioned, oh, by the way, you might want to experiment with diet because right. what you put in your cake hole might be affecting your freaking body. <laughs> like, oh, you, you know. think that they'd want to tell like some doctors out there, hey, might be an idea to let some people know that just, you know, examine what you're putting in your body. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Freaking yeah. really infuriates me. It, yeah. It's going to start to become a conspiracy podcast. But, you know, I mean, the, the common thing is people just say it's about money, right? If you get to prescribe a script, you know, if you get to, if, if you take a pill for the thing, that makes everybody money. It makes the system, the healthcare system money versus saying, ah, eat a little less sugar. I went in it for a checkup. This was pre COVID. And I went in for a checkup and talked about sugar and, you know, talked about like, boy, I really struggle. And when I'm not eating sugar, it's better. And the doctor just said this thing. I swear it was like a line that he recites. He said, well, you know, there can't, there, it's possible that there are health benefits to reducing your sugar intake. I was like, yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> that, it's That's possible. such like a, a weird diplomatic. Yes. You know, like, well, anything's possible. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. weird, isn't it? Anyway, sorry for ranting. So so if there's any doctors out there and you're like being offended, I, I am not <laughs> painting everybody with the same, you know, brush, but I'm just saying that, hey, you know, come on, it's uh, it's 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 pretty crazy. It's, it's a big pretty deal. crazy. Has my camera uh, has my camera switched off for you, Ian? It's just frozen. Oh, there we go. It's <laughs> all good. It's back. There we it's go. Back. So anyway, we're going to jump into the topic, and I do, I do apologize for anybody. And we've had feedback before, guys. Don't catch up on the podcast. Don't talk about your day to day shit that you're dealing with. Just get on with the thing at hand, the topic that is on the video. I mean, on the podcast. 
I, we're going to get better at it, but we're just not going to get it better at it in this episode. We haven't <laughs> we haven't spoken in like a week or something. Hey, give us a break. Anyway, hey, so come on. Yeah. what's the title, Ian? Oh, oh God. Signature it's... Instruments Done. Oh, are they done? They're done. Are they done? Well, let, let me let me tell you this. I when I came up, um, my first bass teacher was like, Hey, you should buy this Billy Sheehan bass because it's awesome. And I did. I bought this Billy Sheehan bass. My grandmother awesome. helped me buy it. I sold it not too long ago, which I, I do sort of regret, but, um, I never, I mean, I love Billy now and I liked Mr. Big, but I was never like a huge Billy Sheehan fan. I wasn't trying to play like him. I, I didn't buy the bass because of Billy. I bought it because, my bass teacher told me to. He right? bikes out scalloped frets, dude. <laughs> yeah, dude, scalloped frets and stereo output and oh my God. But then I did, I was thinking I've never been a signature bass buyer, but that's not true because then later I got way into Brian Bromberg, man, and I had a PV B quad four. Oh, hell that yeah. I also should never have sold. What a cool instrument. Paizo Bridge, and I know I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly, but you could pan each piezo element to a different side of a stereo field. And so the bass no had way. two outputs. So you could put the E string over here and the, you know, whatever. What? I never did that. Wow. But yeah, it was wild. And he has these solo compositions where, you know, the strings are panned and just crazy. But that was the only signature bass I bought because I loved the artist. Yeah. And other than that, and it's no knock against artists that have signature models. I mean, I, technically I have a signature model with Vorin Saku, which we can talk about, but I sort of feel like when I see a signature base, it puts me off and Let's, I can yeah. talk about why, but do, do you have that? Do you have well, something of that? Well, you, I've, I've got various, various sort of like, I guess sort of like uh little mind farts going off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little mind fart. Gross. <laughs> also known as like ideas. Anyway, so, but any, anyway, um, ju just to say, as well, just to dig into my past as well. I can remember when I was like, you know, getting into guitar for the first time. Yeah. Which was in nineteen ninety <laughs> uh, one, I think ninety one. Were, were we thirteen in ninety one? Yeah, something like that. Yes. Okay, so we're like 13 and 91. Yeah, 90s yes. kids, come on, the oh, best. It's the best. Do the ah. best decade. Do you know the what I was doing? The other, like, was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday morning, I was sitting in bed with Story showing him old Commodore 64 games oh, on YouTube. We were watching people. He wanted, he like, he, what, he's into like watching gameplay. I'm like, dude, yeah. let's watch some <laughs> Commodore 64 stuff, the real stuff. Anyway, so back in the day, 1991, yeah. I'm 13, picking up a guitar for the first time. And, and I'm getting into all of the, the, the guys, right? The, 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 the Steve Vai, the yes. Joe Satriani, like Ibanez was the kind of like rock brand of the time. And then yeah. there was like Jackson as well. And they were doing their thing. And then also Fender. Now all of these instrument manufacturers had huge, big, like, Let's put it this way: that signature instruments were a really important part of their strategy, like hugely huge. important. Yeah, huge. Steve Vai had a signature. Joe Satriani had a signature. Like obviously, Billy Sheehan had a signature. Yeah, and then, Stu look, Ham. Stu Ham had a signature, exactly. Um, and then they had all of the, you know, all of the other uh, Eric Clapton signature, Buddy Guy signature on the Fender side. There was a lot oh, of yeah. signatures. Robert Cray signature. There Richie was a Sambora. Richie Sambora signature. It was a whole thing. And then that also crossed over into bass as well. So as yep. I uh, yeah, grew yeah. up, there was all of these signature artists and. And I freaking loved that. Like, if I could have had a jet Steve Vai gem, are you freaking oh, kidding dude, me? I, I would have yeah. given at least a kidney and a half to have one of those things. Like, <laughs> yeah, seriously, yeah. not even yeah. a full, like, more than a full kidney. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, like, I was just, and then the Joe Satria, oh, so good. Anyway, um, it was a huge deal. And then as I got to around 16 years old, I'm 17, then 18, I'm picking up bass for the first time, and same deal. I'm like, there's all of these really awesome signature artists that are working with the brands. 
You know, like Ibanez had Gary Willis, Yamaha had John Patitucci, Nathan East, uh, yep. Billy Sheehan. Um, who, who, like, which of the brands jumped to mind for you that Sovic had those? F Base had Elaine Caron. Oh, there was of like, course. you know, yes. there was all of these sort of like signature artists as well. So I came up, I feel at least like I, I experienced what I would sort of, I guess, sort of, uh, guess sort of like label as the signature guitar or bass heyday it was kind of like of course you know that was when it was kind of happening because it was i don't think it was really something that was vastly done before that like in the 80s i'm not sure if it was like really milked as much but as it went into the 90s it kind of like exploded um, it would be cool to know, like, who did the first – what was the first artist signature series model? I wonder if it was Fender. I don't know. Well, the first um, signature guitar ever. I wonder. Yeah. And if you look that up – I mean, man, I remember Fender, right, being a big one. Remember the Roscoe Beck? Hell yeah. You know, of course, Stu Ham with Kubicki first, but then Fender made him the Urge bass. That was a big one. Um, yeah, and PV, PV had like Rudy Sarzo and Brian Bromberg. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. And I feel like some of those started, obviously the signature stuff started in the 80s, probably mid-late 80s, I'm going to say. Well, the first, this is interesting, the first Fender signature it was an Eric Clapton signature. God damn, I loved that signature as well with that mid boost switch. Oh yeah, that Eric Clapton, and that was in 1992, I think. Wow, That's... 90s. Hey, hey, wow. Wait, wait. Oh no, 1988. Oh, 88, right? 88 so was the first what one. What about okay. the first Ibanez signature guitar? Oh, I wonder. Yeah, I wonder if that was in the 80s as well. I mean, man, yeah, those gems, the floral gems. Oh, so sick. Yeah. Seven string. Do you remember the gem seven? Oh, was dude. <laughs> dude. So good. Yeah. When was it? the first Ibanez? It's, 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 it's not revealing itself. I think it might have been the gem. Hmm. It could have yeah. been the gem. I feel like, you know, probably after it really got popularized, which I feel like, you know, Ibanez and Fender, because Gibson wasn't doing it. There was no little, slash. Maybe somebody's thinking about this. Somebody's like, dude, the Les Paul was the first signature oh, guitar. Oh, yes, dude. I don't even think of that, but of course. Yeah. The Les Paul. Oh, yeah. A couple of idiots right here. I think it here. might have been the 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 gem. It might have been the gem. 1987, the Steve Vai gem. Amazing. Yeah. There was the JS, the 1988, one year after the Joe Satriani. Yeah. Uh, and and then Fender got, then jumped on that train. Exactly, yeah. Paul Gilbert, but, 1990. Yeah. Oh, Paul Gilbert. Why didn't Gibson? So the thing is, the Les Paul is divorced from that for me because it was so early. It was late 50s. They didn't know. It's like they weren't doing it then with other artists, I don't think. I think you know, right. it is divorced although there, from it, isn't it? There's like yeah. a Trini Lopez. There are some, I suppose. Oh, there's probably a Chuck Berry. I'm probably totally wrong. Now as I'm thinking about it, there are Gibson signatures. I just wasn't around then. So I'm like, <laughs> you know that thing of like, ah, there wasn't. <laughs> that stuff didn't exist. because I just wasn't fucking alive, stupid, Ian. <laughs> there were actually a bunch of, as I'm thinking about it, the Robert, oh, oh, the few Fusion guitar. Oh, oh the, gosh. Like that Howard big, Roberts. Howard, Howard Roberts. Roberts. Yeah, yes. Howard Roberts Fusion. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so there were a so few. Gibson, Gibson was doing it. Gibson, Gibson was, was doing, doing it. it, but it wasn't like, I don't feel like it was the signature Hayday. I really feel like there was a moment in time where all of the guitar manufacturers and bass manufacturers were like, oh, we can move some serious units by yes. getting people to endorse these and, you know, putting yes. their signature on top. And I actually, as I was saying just before, I kind of sort of like, and you exactly, we lived through that, that sort of like the heyday of that. And for me, I think that what you said, something really interesting, which was we, this was not planned. This conversation wasn't planned. You were like, sort of like, we were talking about like, what, like whether signature instruments are cool anymore and i was like oh right. like maybe they're not cool anymore and then i posed i was like maybe they're not cool because if you look at all of the people that did have the signatures right let's say joe satriani steve Vai, eric clapton all of these guys right they still got those signature instruments they're still around a few people have 
come into that same kind of like super high status let's say john may yes, right the john of may of course john may's signature right yep but for me, there is there isn't sort of like a new influx of all of those guys anymore, and maybe there's a couple of different reasons for it. It looks to me, especially when we look at the guitar, it was like it was kind of it was very rock orientated, or it seemed mm-hmm. to be a you know it seemed to be quite rock orientated. Now that was very different for basses. Like if you think about the John Patitucci signature, the Gary Willis signature, the Billy you know, like Billy Sheen was obviously rock, but it wasn't so rock focused but maybe they were just it was part of the business strategy at the time because it was working so well so they were like hey let's do it in bass as well so maybe also with, in the beginning the, oh sorry oh well it was all i was going to say is that maybe with the sort of like the die off a little bit of that sort of like shred rock maybe with that it stopped being as effective but then the second thing that i said is that the new superstars of the now i don't think they're as I'm not going to say aspirational. I think that's maybe the wrong word. I'll use aspirational for now, and then we can revisit it, right? They're not as... Or like They don't have the same mystique as the Steve Vai, the Joe Satria. Like, mm. when those guys were, like, in their heyday in the 90s, they no were, like... Media. They were freaking superstars. And, and yeah. if you saw them on the street, you'd be like... Oh, die. Well, like you yes. die. Like I can remember yes. like being at a Steve Vai concert. He walked on stage and it was like a religious experience. I was yes. like, it's oh. like, there he is. I was like, there he is. He's an actual yeah. real person. Like right. the only ever time that you'd hear him, well, you'd never hear him speak, right? Maybe like a random interview on TV at some point, mm. but like there wasn't the internet there. There was no YouTube. So you just, I'd never heard him speak. Maybe I'd read a magazine interview or something yeah, like that. Right, but he, it was right. the separation between the normal people and the the players. There was a cavern. There was the freaking Grand Canyon between us and them. And that, yes. is, that does not exist anymore. Now, when you're a superstar, right. the new kind of like, the new sort of like hit player, you're on Instagram and you are a freaking normal guy or a normal girl and nobody gives a right. shit. And like, you know, the sort of like the, the superstars of the day, people give them shit in the DMs every single day or in the comments on Instagram. People are like, yep. who do you think you are? Like it's that, <laughs> that, I mean, that doesn't exist anymore. That sort of like internet famous is not the same. As mm. for, in terms of like th- the lens I look through, anyway, yes. like being internet famous is not the same as as being like a, 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 a what was like a superstar musician, where there was yes. a cavern between normal people and the superstars. It just doesn't exist anymore. The, all of these people are normal people now. Like I've, you know, w- you just see like Charles Bertu, he's a superstar. Right. You know, he's like he's he's like one point five two million subs on YouTube or something like that. Yep. When he releases a video. He gets like 300,000, 400,000 views on that. There's yep. nobody dying when they see Charles in the street. And that's no sort of like dig against Charles. They're just like, whoa, Charles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How's it yeah, going, right. dude? Like yeah. they will they, talk they've to seen him immediately. A lot, actually, yes. they've seen him on the feed a lot. Yeah. How, how about this as an exception? How about two exceptions? Um, Mono Neon. Yes. Okay. I think there are exceptions i think that that's the really interesting thing mono neon is kind of like has that elusive not an elusive character but he's not sort of like plastered everywhere i'm not saying people are plastered everywhere. what i'm saying is there there seems to be sort of like a little separation there and by the way i'm not sort of like having to dig at anybody by saying this i'm just saying that the, the the old model where it was like us normal people and superstars it was very aspirational they were like oh man i want to be like them and i think that that gap has really closed and and like i'm not sure that anybody wants to play a scott divine signature or a charles mm. bear two signature or an ian allison signature because we're just normal right. freaking guys yeah it's like it's mono neon is not going hey guys what's going on hey today i'm gonna you know into the right he is keeping some separation he posts a lot but it's more like artful posts it'll yeah. be interesting you know um who else has a signature coming out i mean she told us this on the podcast yeah blue, and, you know, blue to tiger yeah blue yeah blue to tiger and it's here here's the thing man i saw her in Minneapolis, she opened up for Sabrina Carpenter and there were thousands. Well, it was a, it was a state theater. So, you know, maybe two, 3000 people there. They were all like young women. Yeah. And they 
love her. And she was, she was talking about this, like in the green room, she was saying, there are so many like young girls that come up to me and say like, what, like, I love your guitar. And she's like, Oh yeah. Have you ever, it's a bass. And some of them don't, you know, they don't know the difference and some of them do, but she's responsible for like, there are young people that like, maybe are going to get into music. Well, absolutely have actually because of blue. And that's what I think is like the signature series instrument, especially at an affordable price point is perfect for like kids, for young kids people be, yeah. that are getting in. Absolutely, and I think that yeah. in the beginning, do Les Pauls were expensive. The Trini Lopez model was expensive. The, the custom shop, Eric Clapton, Sig expensive, gem expensive, Joe Satriani expensive, Billy yeah. Sheehan all the way through. And then at some point people realized, Oh wait, the market isn't necessarily guys in their late thirties to, to early sixties that have uh-huh. money to spend on their hero guitar player. It's kids. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? And just to put it out there, I could be completely wrong. <laughs> I could be completely wrong, but it, but it is interesting. And I don't think that there are these slews of new signature players. There are like the outliers, mono neon, right? Um, yep. Tos- uh, what's his, what's the guy's name? Tosin from Abasi. Yeah. Tosin Abasi's obviously he's yeah. got, he's a, he did have a signature Ibanez, didn't he? But then he went and he's, he's got his own brand now. There are like Jake Imansky, you know, yeah. like Jacob, obviously not a good, uh, not a get good. Yeah. There are some people that, that do that seem to make it work. Is it a little different? Do they have the signature on the front anymore? I, I still think it's changed it's a little low. I think, yeah, <laughs> it's changed yeah. a little, isn't it? Right. Yeah. It's changed. It's on the back because, yeah. because I just don't think it's the same. I think that it's a more yeah. connected, more real kind of. Yeah. Well, and how about this one? We're forgetting Corey Wong. I mean, monster yeah. artist yeah. and then has a signature series. And, but so how about this? You like Pino Palladino, Scott? You're a Pino fan. I'm a I'm big a P- Pino I'm fan. I'm a Pino fan. Are you buying that bass and playing that bass? No, I'm not buying Would... that bass because his name's on it. Right. I'm not buying it because I don't want to. I don't want to play a signature bass. I'm sort of like it's like. And I'm, look, but, and, but and, hold dude, on, hold oh, on. I've got a great fucking story to tell you about Gary Willis. Oh, it's so good. Oh, Gary, I love yeah, you. Yeah, because Lil, Lil Willis, dude. Lil Willis, yeah. So I'm not getting the, the Pino bass because I, it's like, I, come on, it's a Pino signature. Do you know what I mean, I'm like, right. I'm trying to sort of like be my own musician, like my own sound and stuff like that, right? And I think, here's the, here's the deal. As soon as you play... Uh, a bass with somebody's signature on it. As soon as you do that, that starts to erode the the previous statement that I just mentioned. I'm trying to, I'm mm. I'm trying to find my own sound. As yeah. soon as you pick up that bass with the signature on, it erodes that in some way, shape, or form. Which is why you know we've talked about it over the you know, the last few weeks that I was like, oh, I want to play Fretless on this album. I've got this Willie signature. Like, I'm a massive fan of Gary, like great friends with Gary. I'm like, but I can't turn up with the Willie signature. I'll just be a little Willis. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. well Gary yeah, yeah, emailed yeah. me about it. He emailed me about it. <laughs> he sent me two emails, really. Actually, yeah. yeah. He sent me two emails. So he emailed the first one and yes. he was like, and he was like, oh, like somebody mentioned that the, the sustain on the, on the signature, the Willie signature that you have isn't as good as a previous one. And he was like, it might be like something to do with the fretboard wood that's given it a different, different vibe because they changed the fretboard would um do you want me to send me your but my base he was like i'll post you my personal base oh i was so like nice, i know it's dude. amazing what a dude. Isn't it? i know what a oh dude my God. Uh, yeah, yeah so he was like i'll post oh, you my Gary. base and you can use my base and i was like oh i was like that's so amazing and i was like actually it wasn't i think what i'd said was taken slightly out of context and I was like, there's nothing wrong with the sustain. I was like, and then I explained to him what it was. And uh, and then I said, actually, I'm like, I'm not sure what I'm going to use on the app. And I didn't say it's because I don't want to be a little Willis. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I didn't yeah, use yeah. that terminology, you know. Oh, yeah, right, but then he emailed right. me back and he was like, oh, and he, he got it. He was like, he emailed me back and he was like, actually, I was in the same um, the same boat when he said I was, you know, mm. he said I was playing a fretless jazz bass. And he said, Jocko. Yeah. And he said, I, I knew that I didn't want, I couldn't play that because he was going to be a little Jacko. 
Yeah. So it was dude. so funny that he messaged me about like I was like saying about being a little Willis and he was like, Oh, I was in the same situation. Of I was course. Yeah, based out in LA. He was playing his uh, you know, the four string fretless and he was like, I didn't want to be the little Jacko. I didn't want right. to be you know, for people just to automatically be like, Oh, he's just a fretless player using that thing that Jacko did, right? So all that to say that yeah, it was a funny well, conversation. He, here's the thing: Does relationship change this for you? Because you know Gary, you've studied with Gary. I, you you could say that you're friends with Gary. I mean, you guys have done a bunch of different things together. You've no, you've had a long, long time with Gary in your life. Yeah, dude, and I've so taken him out some that, pizza. We, 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 we've buried some pizzas together. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I mean, does that change it then? Like, this is a friend of yours, and so it's instead of like, I mean, obviously you look up to him, you love his playing. You studied with him. He was a guru. But also now, now I would say you guys are more like peers than he's your, you know, top down bass teacher guru. Yeah. And does that change the dynamic? I don't, a little bit, but not enough to, for, for me to be sort of like, I, I still think it erodes that sort of like, I want to find my, my own sound. And I think, yeah. that yeah. So all that to say that it was just an interesting spot to be in. But I do think that the signature bass signature guitar era even though mm. i love like i love them because i grew up with them it's like i love commodore 64s right um, it yeah. doesn't mean that i'm going to get one i love commodore 64s um i love signature basses i actually think it is freaking awesome because it is a celebration of yeah, of right. that player like i was trying to push marcel over f bass I was like, he was like, well, we, we don't really do signature because we were talking about doing signature and a signature bass, and um, and he was like, and this was actually before, so it wasn't. I wasn't trying to twist his arm, saying, hey, we should do a signature bass. It was actually a conversation before that I was having with, with Marcel over F bass, and he was like, well, we don't really do a signature basses, and I was like, dude, you should do a signature bass. Mm. I was mm -hmm. like, Rich Brown should have a signature F bass because. Right. That guy is a freak show and we should be celebrating everything about him, you know, and I do believe that there mm. always should be a space for signature bases. I really do. And I think yeah. there always will be a market for signature bases. Uh, but, but I don't think it's just, I just don't think it's as big as it used to be because I think the dynamic between the audience and the player has changed. And mm. what we were talking about is like, I wonder if there's a, I wonder what, like if it isn't signature bases anymore, by the way, Marcel, if you ever listen to this, you should do a Rich Brown signature bass. Please, 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 please. Because <laughs> Rich is amazing. And yeah. and any other Luthiers listening to this, you should do signature. I'm not saying like that our statement of or our question like of our signature bass is done. It's like not me saying they should be it should be done. And it's not I don't think the nails in the coffin or anything like that. I actually think there's a, a real fantastic spot for signature bases. And I think that we should be celebrating these artists. And giving the the fans of these artists the opportunity to play the same bass and all of that, sure. right? Yeah. I think that that is but I just think the heyday of it yeah. is done. I think that's because over. it lets you into a player's perspective, right? Yeah. I, I was thinking about, so the guys in intervals, right? So Jacob Umansky, who has this killer Dingwall oh, signature so coming good. out. So and good. I played his bass and I love Jacob and, I, you know, we're friends. And so thinking about like, I would play his bass happily. Now, I don't know that I would play it on like when I'm going to do my record, I'm, pr I'm not playing that bass, right? But I'd absolutely use it on sessions because yeah. it's his bass. But I was thinking about this too. I was thinking about Aaron Marshall from intervals who's like the leader main guitar player in intervals and he has a killer Schechter that's the brand Schechter signature and when I saw it the colorways were so cool it's Wenge neck oh, yeah. so it's almost you know it's oh. like oh like Dingwall does that but I've Wenge, never seen dude. that on a guitar <laughs> and when I was at gear fest last summer I got to see it and it was really cool and the way they did the pickups and the way just everything about the guitar was so interesting and so much of his dna and his pushing that brand forward and that's what i like is when there is an artist that really wants to solve problems or really want certain design features yes. or has some really cool ideas yes. about yes. instrument development. Yeah. That's when I get on board, you know, and it's hard for me if it's just color, 
if it's just a color with a signature on the back of the headstock, I, I'm personally not interested in 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 playing that instrument. You want more. But, I do. I want a player. I want a player to call Fender and say, I have the idea. I have an idea for the perfect jazz bass. It would incorporate these features of early 60s, late 60s, early 70s, late 70s. I know how we're going to craft the, you know, like I want someone with that kind of passion to be involved in instrument development. And if that person is an artist, it gives them more leverage for development and all that to say, that's what I want for myself. Right. And now, yeah. you know, I mentioned, I have a Voren Saku signature base. Um, and it was, I was so, um, when that happened, it was the first time that had happened for me. It was the first time someone came to me and said, Hey, you know, Saku from Voren Saku was like, I want to build you this. And I was so flattered. Right. But then what we came up with was really what I think is this incredible combo of Fender things. It's a little bit Mustang. It's a little bit 51. It's a little bit jazz bass. It's a little bit Coronado. It's a little bit bass six. And I think what we did is we assembled this incredible like short scale super Fender that I would be so excited if more people got to play. They're they're very expensive. The build times are long, right? It's not a it's not, you know, a a twelve hundred dollar instrument where you can buy it off the shelf. But I was really excited to be involved, not to have a signature bass. I'm actually kind of like, it kind of makes me throw up a little bit uh, like, oh, the the IMA SIG, you know, like, hey, but yeah. to be involved in instrument design, to bring something to market that I think actually pushes the conversation forward is that's what I want to do. I'm laughing because I'm like the opposite i'm like give me a signature bass bitches <laughs> yeah, yes, dude. i'm like yeah put me on the front of that magazine and just and, and just give me a signature oh bass and i'll do anything i'll run around the streets naked <laughs> oh my god yeah I, see i yeah i don't want that i don't yeah, want that yeah. because I, I think like my ego is too fragile i like i wouldn't want someone to say oh because i i I am self-aware enough to know that I don't have the name leverage like Flea, like Thundercat, like yeah, Mononean. Yeah, yeah, Give me a yeah. break, right? Um, there are certain like side musicians that have signature series that I feel like, ah, yeah, that's very cool. JMJ, Justin Meldel Johnson comes to mind. Hurley, right? Sean Hurley gets the John Mayer gig, gets that incredible signature series, and it's got the mute, and that's cool. But for me, I don't think that... I wouldn't suppose that adding my name to an instrument gives it now. Now people are more invested in buying it. I don't think so. I, I think, think they would be really. I think because it's an Ian see Martin it. Allison signature. You think yeah. they would be really three yeah. people? Uh, eight no, people? I think <laughs> right. Okay. So do you, let me ask you, do you think that, people, do you think that rich Brown should have an F base signature? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is Rich Brown massively cooler than you? Is he a better human? Should no. we celebrate Rich Brown more than you? I don't think so. Yeah. I think that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I've I've met both of you guys and both of you are beautiful human beings. Um like my point is that that some people might look at Rich and they might, mm. might be like, actually, I do not want a six string F bass. And, sure. and, and, and I'm never gonna be able to play like that, and that's fine. But this Ian guy over here who's getting all of these incredible sounds and, 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 and he's like the bass player's bass player and sort of like, and has all of this awesome slap technique and they listen to you doing all of that. I can absolutely see somebody being like, I just want to do that. Mm. I just want to do that. And I think there's also some people that will be like, cause I know I was saying as soon as you play somebody's signature instrument, if you, if your quest in life mm. is to develop your own musical voice, right? This is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That that's great. Right. But some people don't want that. You're some right. people want to play just like you and some people mm. want to play just like Rich Brown. And that is valid too. I think that that is mm. valid. So yeah, I think that there there is absolutely room <laughs> in this world for a Ian Martin Allison signature bass. And I don't think that you should be sick in your mouth about it. You can put the signature on the back of the headstock. <laughs> I, I think I just think that for me, what I want 
people to know is that I wouldn't be doing a, like I'm, I'm not interested in doing a signature model to make money or to to um, to have some sort of like puffy chest about it. I would want to bring something new to the table that I could look you in the eye, fellow bass players, and say, yeah. this is rad for these reasons. Like, this is why I like it. And this, it, it, this is not a money grab. This is something new and something really exciting, something that I'm going to play and be really excited about. Uh, and yeah. you, you need to check it out. That's what I want. So there, there, there you know, I'm in some talks divine. There's a well, couple of things moving around right now. So, There's a couple so, of things. Somebody jumps to mind actually that they have a signature base, but, but, uh, there's there's a, a little there's a difference right so huh that's interesting anyway I'll, I'll just i'm about to go down this rabbit hole but what i was gonna say is when you were talking specifically about what you're interested in is when an artist works with a company and brings to light certain design features or yes. pickup combinations or whatever it is the there's a different spin that comes off of that instrument yes. because of the the collaboration between yes. the artist and the luthier. And somebody that actually did a great job of this is uh, Matt Garrison with Federa. Mm. And even going like one step back from that is Anthony Jackson with Federa. Yeah. You're so right. Yes. What he, he actually really went on a, like it really, so for me, his relationship with all of the luthiers, Ken Smith before it was Carl, began with Carl Thompson, first six yep. string bass, then it was Ken Smith, then it was um, Federa. If you if you look at the history of that, the development of Anthony Jackson's instruments, he was on a quest. Actually, it was fuck all to do with money. He was on a yes, quest right. to to find the perfect instrument, to, build to develop, the perfect yes, instrument. to develop, yes, to to develop in collaboration with a luthier this perfect instrument for him. And I think that that also, when I listen to Matt Garrison, shout out to Matt. Uh, when I listen to him talk about his collaboration with Federa, same deal. It's like you can hear there's this sort of like passion, this, this, it's not a, hey, we got the same thing, we made it a different colour and we stuck mm. their name on. In fact, Anthony Jack, none of the Federa um, signatures have any signatures on the on the head on the front mm. of the headstock, right? So it kind of really with Matt Garrison, it really does when you think about like he he was originally the single cut, but now it's like this shoot super weird short scale thing, and like I've heard him talk about that collaboration with Federa and how he was searching for you know the perfect instru uh, instrument for him. I think that it's. The the devil's in the detail in, in what you were like leaning into with it. It's when it's done in a way that is um they're searching for something. There's a search. Yeah. It's not a it's not a commercial play. It's more of a uh like a passion and heart play yeah. of let's fucking get together and yes. see if we can search and find something awesome. And the thing that yes. is, that they find that is awesome is this instrument that they collaborate on and birth the world. And whether it has their name on, who cares to a certain extent, yep. right? Especially when it's more of a sort of like a heart-led, passion-driven thing. So I think that in many ways, um, Federa, like there's some instruments that they've created that I think are awesome, actually. Thinking about, and totally. they're not, yeah, like the Anthony Jackson one. It's really cool. Matt Garrison was very um, influential. His signature yes. bass, come on. Like oh, I know. the late 90s, early 2000s, that sort of like influenced so many different it's people. Big deal. Big deal. Uh, Lincoln Goins, his signature instrument oh, with, yeah, the, yeah. with the one pickup. One pickup. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. one pickup. Tom Kennedy has got a very interesting sort of uh, pickup combination on his as well. I'm mm. thinking about different one, uh, Ryan Ryan from Mudvayne. He's just done something recently with oh, Federa. That's right. Yeah, and 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 I, I kind of dig their approach to the signature thing. I, I kind of do. Mm. I'm not exactly. I haven't really thought this through. I'm kind of think, thinking on my feet, but I do like their approach to the signature thing. Anyway, you were saying that uh, we were discussing that collaborations with because shops actually collaborate with yes. instrument makers don't they like ish guitars or i'm trying to think of other um 
God damn like, I can't think you know, of anything. <laughs> Sweetwater I mean, Fish actually, guitars. Yeah, Sweetwater exclusives. Exactly, there was, you know, yeah. remember Bass Northwest way back yes. in the day? I think they did a few things like that. And oh, yeah, there, there were other MTD shops guys. as well. Dude, Groove Shop. Can you remember the Groove Shop? Groove Shop, yes, for sure. Yes. Groove Shop were well, not around anymore, but they sort of like they collaborated collaborated with uh, MTD Mike Tobias and some of the bases that they it's like they understood how to like the bases that came out of the groove shop that was the same design that yep. of all the, all of the other Mike Tobias things but they had this special sauce that was there yeah. they kind of could spend time with the customer and talk about wood combinations and stuff like that and every every yep. freaking base i saw that was the collaboration between the Groove Shop and MTD just looked spectacular. Yes. So, yes. and you posed the question right on the top of the conversation. You were like, I wonder whether artists are going to go that way, whether it will be less of a signature model and more of a collaboration model. My yep. question to you is, my mm. question to you is, what is the difference between what happened with Anthony Jackson, Matt Garrison, Lincoln Goins, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and, and this other model, collaboration model, is it is it semantics or not? Maybe it is. It might be. I just think the right now, you know, where we've got everybody is thinking about their personal brand, you know, and everyone has this giant broadcast beacon of social media. There is a really unique opportunity for people on the Internet to be a part of that culture and to essentially promote these instruments. Right. Mm -hmm. And so instead of thinking about like, yeah, the it's, it's almost the other way around, right? Where, remember, you know, if you got the big ad on the back of bass player magazine and you're Victor Wooten, for instance, with the yin yang bass yeah, or yeah. something, right. It was like, it was almost as if the brands were promoting the artists that way. And I know that it was cyclical. I know that, I know that, you know, Fodera, of course, didn't give Victor Wooten all of his leverage. It was cyclical. But yeah. didn't it feel like the companies were kind of on the top? And then the artists, oh, and they were yeah. promoting the artists, and they were promoting the artist projects and records. And well, it yeah. almost feels like it could, there is this opportunity for people acting as brands to almost flip it to where they are actually helping to promote sell, develop these things for the brands. Yeah. How do you feel yeah. about that? Yeah, I dig it. Yeah, it's kind of flipped, hasn't it? Yeah, I think that you're, that you're bang on in terms of like, we know these, we know we knew a lot of the mu musicians because of the signature deals they had with Ibanez, yes. because of the yes. signature deals they had with Yamaha, right? Because Yamaha and Ibanez and all of the other manufacturers would pay for ads in magazines, and uh, rightly so, they'd plaster their signature artists all over right. the ads, right? So that's why we know about them. But now, now, because it's traffic, because the traffic was going to the magazines. But where is the traffic going now? The traffic goes to the individual, the influencers, individual influencers on on Instagram or whatever platform yes. they're on. So the traffic is going to the influencer first and then the influencer can shine a light on the actual brand itself. God. Oh, wow. Weird. Influ influencer signatures. <laughs> oh, yeah. Influencer signatures. Yeah, yeah. It's super weird, isn't it? Uh, there are going to be people that are so pissed about it, but um, that's what's coming, I think. And I mean, or I, influence I just think the collabs, maybe. And I think that exactly, maybe it's the heart, maybe it's the maybe it is semantics to a certain extent, whether it's a collab or a signature instrument. But maybe yep. there's so, for instance, the difference could be well, it maybe sort of like comes from a different place emotionally. So there's more sort of like, hey, we're tr we're going to try and create something we're going to try and find something and create something together in an explore in an exploration exactly. of, of, of tone or sounds rather just like hey we're going to do some like new color or whatever right but also maybe it's like maybe it's something that a signature instrument is one of these things for for the most part where it needs to it's when it's done it's done and there will be developments over time but they're not going to be that many it's like if you look at the John Patitucci Yamaha signature from, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it is pretty much the same as it is now. You know, sure. like they've made a few tweaks with Gary Willis, same deal, right? With Steve Vai, to a certain extent, same deal, right? But with collabs, maybe 
that cycle gets shortened down. Mm. Mm-hmm. Maybe that might maybe the cycle gets shortened down. Maybe you could do a collab every year. Maybe you could do a oh, collab yes. every six months. You oh, know, yes. more of a maybe it gives you more swings to actually go and yeah, create and it, find something new together. And it also just doubles your exposure. So it, two two things coming together. I mean, you can just see it when you do like a you know like a collaborative reel on Instagram. It just doubles exposure. So it would be silly not to do it. And I mean. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity actually for both for both partners in the equation to get something out of it. Yeah. And I just, you know, I was talking to a company. I I can't talk about it yet, but I will say this. I've been talking to a company and I'm really super excited about an instrument um, that we're going to collaborate on. And I said to the guy that runs the company, I would be mortified if you got a call from from a potential customer that said I really really like this bass can you scrub the decal off of the back of the headstock yeah, yeah <laughs> you know yeah, what yeah, i mean yeah, or like yeah, could you yeah. make one without you know and i just because i don't want that to be a barrier i don't want to be like hey it's the ian martin allison bass and there's a little stupid picture of my hat and glasses on it and you're going to oh it's going to be so fun and cute and don't you love me i just feel like that i am too self aware I don't think uh, it needs a signature on it, though. I, I agree. I agree. Here, here's, here's the play, dude. Here's the play. Okay, tell me it's the play. A, it, it, it is a collaboration. It's, yes. You're doing a collaboration. In a, in a way, and I'm not, I'd have to sort of like think this through. In a way, though, I think that you can say, hey, we're doing this collaboration. You don't even need to say the word signature base. I know. Right? Let's exactly. remove that, okay? But. Exactly. But. Okay. Yeah. So you're doing a collaboration. Okay. Um, at this, like when you talk about the cool f- features and stuff like that, at some, at somewhere on the, on the headstock or the neck, there's like a tiny little, do you know where you can do the little punching things? And it just says your initials and their initials. And it's just a representation of the collaboration that happened for people. Yeah, I mean- for people yeah. that, that actually do want your initials on it, that do sure. care, right? But it's not maybe a state- it's backside of the control cavity. Yeah, that's maybe, fine. Well, it's more like a Federa <laughs> type thing because Federa don't have signatures on their on their bases. Right. I don't, at least yeah. I don't think they do, right? Yeah. So it's so you just don't say it's a collaboration between you and them. Blah blah blah. blah yeah. Blah. Here's the devil's in the detail, all right? And it's a limited run. Oh yeah. It's a limited oh, yeah. run, and you're only ever going to make twenty of them, or you're I only know. ever going to make 30, whatever it is. And then that's it done. That is it done. You never make them again because that oh, yeah, collaboration sure. was for a specific. T- it's not like, hey, we're going to do them in runs. It's like, no, that is it. Oh, these, it is, and then these are it forever. That is it Ooh. forever. Yeah, that's and interesting. Then, yeah. And then there's a different collaboration next year. And you do, hey, right. you know, we did this collaboration last year. It was amazing. You know, we made 20 of these instruments. Um, and it was, and and we were trying to, what we were trying to do is whatever the concept was. The collaboration yes. has has a reason to exist yes. rather than, hey, we just want to create a signature base. has a reason to exist. Just like the way you spoke to, about the Vorin Saku, right? You spoke about Vorin Saku and you said it, it was like it's, it's fendery. It's got a bit of Mustang. There was a... You were trying it. There was a bullseye, and you were trying to hit the bullseye, right? So this, yeah, right. So this co- collab that you do, there's a bullseye. You try and hit the car, the, the target, and you say, that, you know, this is what we're trying to do here. We're trying right. to we're collaborating artist and luthier, and this is the target. Yes. You, your name is associated with it, as is theirs, because I think it's important that it's associated with it. But when they make it, then it is done, and then the next time you do a collaboration, the bullseye is different. And you do yeah, a different right. bullseye. You're like, hey, Interesting. we did yep. this. There was 20 before. We're actually going to do another one. This time, the idea is to try and encapsulate this. Like, this is the target that we're going after, right? And yes, yeah. of course, you can be like, hey, you know, actually we did, you know, 20 of these last year. At whatever point, you can be like, actually, we're going to do another limited run of 20. My point yeah. is oh, yeah. that you right. don't have one collaboration. I think that you could have 
three, multiple. four. You can have well, multiple d- collaborations. Dude, that's yeah. the thing too for, for, oh, I hate this idea of a signature series base. And now, oh, I've got to put masking tape over the headstock of if I use something else. Or it's just for me, someone who loves all the different thumbprints. I love a Rickenbacker, dude. I love a Spectre. I love a classic P bass, a jazz bass. I love like all of these different things. And so for me to be like, well, now I guess I'm just playing BC rich. It's not BC rich by the way, but, (laughs) but you know what I mean? Like that's preposterous. It's not, it's not realistic. It's not fair. And, and if I were to do that, Everyone would know, oh, someone backed a truck of money up to Ian's door. He's only playing that one bass and everything else is gone. That must yeah, have been about yeah, money. Yeah. And I am not, first of all, no one is backing up a dump truck of money to my door. If anyone would like to hit me up, but I, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is helping to develop something that I think is really great for me, but also I'm seeing it like, oh, people don't know that this is going to be sick. People don't know, they they don't even know what they're missing and not in a top down haughty way, but like I've, I've been thinking about this for decades and I think, man, if we got this out, people would be really excited about this subtle change or maybe even this big change. And I'm excited to bring that to market versus just, oh, I've got, I've got the only one on the gig, but yeah, dude, small batches, you know, who crushes batches? Uh, pedal Sarek. manufacturers. Oh, Sarek. Well, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Pedal manufacturers, and when Sarek yeah. does the grand, when Jake Sarek releases the grand, it's a new color every, I don't know how often he does it, once, twice a year. They they sell out. They're like, <laughs> and I have a couple of Sareks, and I don't need the grand, but whenever I see it, it's like a feature set that he doesn't do. It has an inbuilt fuzz circuit. It's got a cool pickup. It's like a body shape that's reserved only for it. Different colorways. When he does it, I'm like, I want this. Like, of course. And, and I was like, yeah. oh, I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to grab one. And then I went, you know, a day later. Huh, tell me, oh, I'll grab one the next day. Oh, do no, you, Ian. No, because they sold out in 17 minutes, dude. So marketing psychology for you, okay? Yes. So, um... Not that I know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the easiest way to 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 get, you know, the, the thing that crushes humans <laughs> into yes. like, oh, I need to buy it. And, it. and this is obviously used by, you know, people around the world to sell whatever, like cars and basses yes. and guitars and clothes and stuff like that, is two, two things. Not regarding price, actually, because everybody's thinking, oh, to make it cheaper or whatever. It's, it's actually urgency and scarcity. Mm -hmm. those two emotions uh, like really they make people go crazy so urgency or let's let's actually we'll go with scarcity first right what's scarcity let's say jake's eric right or you're doing a a collaboration with um a manufacturer right what is scarcity the scarcity is the number of instruments that you're going to make so if you openly state we are only making 10 we're only making 20 we're only making whatever the number is that is instrumental in the actual the sale of the bases the campaign totally. right it's going to be huge so the scarcity is number one uh, and then urgency is number two so the urgency it yes. would be hard to manufacture for the first for the first uh, run of bases but as you just mentioned with jake the urgency is everybody knows that they are going to sell out like freaking in 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 a day so the scarcity is he's probably like, hey, I'm going to do X amount of bases of yep. what are they called? The uh, what was the it? The grand. The grand. Yeah, the I'm grand. going to do twenty or thirty, however many he does, and everybody knows that they're going to sell it in a day. That is yep. that drives humans bonkers, basically. Yes, I that's, know. That's what drives you know people to and, buy. And then those colorways will never be available again. You know, it's so smart and it's also fun. I mean, I get it. I get that it's dastardly in a way, you know, but it's also it's sweet. Like it's such a fun model and I I think um Jake is incredible and Jake, you know, brought something brand new. The Grand isn't just, you know, a Lincoln with a different color or a Midwestern with a different color. It's a completely different base oh, that's yeah. only available, you know, in those windows, which is so I, fun. I, I like it. I like yeah. that the sort of like when people use urgency and scarcity because I think that ultimately humans are freaking we're a pain in the ass. Like <laughs> I am I'm one of the 
there's two types of buyers, right? Turtles, or actually tortoises and hares. I was going to say turtles and hares. Tortoises and hares. Some buyers, right? Something comes up for sale, you know, or whatever, you know, and they they are like, you know, like you've seen them westerns, right? And they're yeah. old dudes and they've got like the hands like right next to the, they're about to do a oh, gunfight yeah. in the street and the hands yeah. are poised and ready. Well, just, <laughs> just like that, but it's their wallet instead. And they are just, <laughs> poised, they're just like, take my money. Okay. They're the hares. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And then there's yeah. the tortoises and I am a tortoise. I yes. am a freaking pain in my own ass. I will think about buying something. I'm just sort of like mm-hmm. sit on the sidelines I am one of these individuals that even if I know I want it, I'll just I'm sort of like contemplate wait. and I'll procrastinate and I'll wait yeah. and all of that. You'll uh, watch the item in your reverb thing. It'll just yeah. be in your watch feed. Exactly. Yeah. All of that. Shit. Same. So thank you yep. to anybody that does things like this, that puts, you know, campaigns together and, and, and sells things using scarc- scarcity and urgency. Thank you from people like me that actually drives me to, it's not that I don't want it. I do want it, but it's just yeah. my natural inclination is to sit on the sidelines and watch everybody else buy it. So yeah, I, I kind of need that. And, and you know, it's, it, it, we're, we're just strange beasts, aren't we? We're really strange oh, beasts. Totally. But totally. dude, I think that there's uh I think that, yeah, I think it's really interesting. I, I, like, I think that you should absolutely do it. I also want to say as well that I do um, think that, or, or at least want to pay appreciation to instruments that are developed over time. I think that, like, early when I was talking about the John Patitucci bass or the, the Willis, but let's say the Willis bass, for instance, right? I love it when somebody's developed a, a signature bass over 20 years or two decades, yeah. or like Matt Garrison, right. who's been sort of like tweaking that thing for like years, you know? Yep. For instance, last year, it went in, he had all of the, so his, his Federa signature that he plays, black one, it went in, it was stripped entirely, and they reduced the body width down. I'm like, I love that <laughs> shit. I'm just like, yes, because he's constantly uh, tinkering. He's a tinkerer. Yes. And if it wasn't right. a bass and he didn't play bass, he might have a car and he'd be tinkering yeah. with it. They're like, right. I love people like, you're actually a tinkerer, aren't you? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yes. just sort of like constantly tweaking and tinkering with yep. stuff. I freaking, I think that the world needs tinkerers. <laughs> Can I tell you what I'm in the process of doing right now with oh. the company and people that will remain unnamed? Oh yeah, I'm in the process it. of testing pot values, resistance oh, yes, values, yes, and tone caps and yeah. the way it's wired because I absolutely am in love with these pickups. But I feel like with a one meg pot, we might be able to bring even more top end out of it, which would be a benefit, I think. But we're not sure. What, so we're, one we're, meg is in sort of like tone fully open. Yeah. So like, you know, the 250K, 500K and one meg are sort of yeah. the three volume pots on a passive bass. Yeah. 250s are the standard for a Fender, really bright pickups like a jazz bass. Standard's 250. And so they're going to take that really bright pickup and darken it down. Whereas humbuckers typically have 500s because humbuckers are a little dark. So you're a little, little more high end come through the circuit but one megs were oh, in I, for, like jazz masters maybe jaguars and one megs are almost like just wiring the pickup straight to the jack and bypassing yeah, 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 those God. controls they just let a little more top end through anthony and jackson not, style right anthony yeah, jackson used to wire his like, pickup straight to the jack yeah. yeah but like one meg pots on a jazz bass i think is awful it sounds super bright. You're always reaching for the tone knob. 250 sounds so lovely because it's sort of, you know, you still get some of that top, but it's like focused lower in the treble range. Anyway, yeah. I love that stuff, dude. I love it. Yeah, me too, man. Me too. And we're going to make the perfect the perfect thing for you, for you all out there. It, and it's going it, to be so fun. Do you know what shape it's going to be? Yeah. Is it going to be like regular? Can you can you mention the shape? Oh no! <laughs> uh, th- there's a couple of things I'm working on actually. You one cre- is greedy little devil. One, <laughs> one is regular, and one is slightly irregular. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. And don't ask me any more questions. I won't, Jesus! I won't, I won't, I won't. If anybody's <laughs> I feel asked- like you've seen them. You've seen them both. So stop it. Oh, I have seen <laughs> yeah, them both. Yeah, you've seen them both. I have seen them both, yeah. You have. Uh, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good. Shush. Oh, isn't bass great? Sorry, <laughs> I just, you know what I did that? I was like looking over. I was just like staring at my bass. I don't know if you well, can see well, them dude, in the car. Listen, like, you, oh. you need to get on this train, Divine, because yes, over water, Scott Divine's signature. Is that, can someone still order that instrument? I imagine so, yeah. Yeah, I imagine yeah. so, yeah. But, uh, come on, F bass. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love I'd love to do something with F bass. The problem is, let me just grab my cans. I'm going to have to bounce in one second. Just, let me grab this, this bass. The problem... <laughs> the problem is that I'm actually, like, in love with this bass. Like, I'm in love yeah. with it. Um there's certain things, like I've actually just put these on today, oh, cool. these controls, because I've, yep. I've, I was like, I didn't like them being the same. I wanted, I wanted it to be really clearly visual where the knobs mm. were. And it wasn't yes. really clear with these black knobs. So I actually took the originals off and replaced yep. them with these big fat ones. So I can really clearly awesome. see what's going on there. And then with these ones, like I think it it could be beneficial to. I'm not sure. I'm sort of like the the jury's out. I don't like the idea of having like six big fat knobs on the front of the bass. So I like having these a different size. But I always have this treble all the way off. Mm. So I don't know. And then I always have these all the way up. So full up, bass full, mid, mid full. full. Yeah, treble all the way off. Yeah. Amazing. And then I sort of like tinker with these. Um, I generally am favoring what an experiment I was doing today was what's it like with the tone all the way up, yep. but the treble all the way off. Oh, right. Yeah. Versus. Because it's active. Yeah. Versus treble all the way up and tone all the way up. So, so like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, it was interesting. I actually think I prefer treble all the way off. Mm-hmm. And tone all the way up, but sometimes I just back it off a little bit. The tone, <laughs> just a little, just a smidge, depending yeah. on just like it was a geek factory. Do you know what I mean? Oh, but yeah, great. I am actually really loving this bass. I'm really loving this bass. So I don't know, dude. I want, I want a Scott Divine Sig that's in those colors, like I, like what, a, the yellow? a yellow, a pink. And an orange, yeah. or a, you I know want, what I mean. I want to do the pink one, yeah. Yeah, the and then one. and then with specific with knobs that you like, right? And with like it's because a neck all carve those little well. things, the neck carve, dude. All those things matter. All those things matter, and they and it's the the devils in the details, as you like to say. Devils in the detail, and what I yeah. what I would love to try as well is a neck. So neck like this. So like you know, it's a bolt on neck, obviously, um, but um, neck with a slip with a different carve to this. Um, and, and Wenge in it because I freaking oh, yeah. love Wenge. Same. Um, it, it just sort of like you get this sort of like compression within the sound that you just I haven't heard within another wood before. Um, so yeah, so that neck carve. No, no, sorry, not that neck carve. Slightly different neck carve um, with a Wenge uh, Wenge strips in it, or maybe just a big fat Wenge strip. So time to batch them up, Divine. Time to batch them up, baby. Call up time. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to Marcel about it a few months ago, and I was just like. It was. I was in the midst of just sort of like trying to get to you know do the the album that I'm recording next week, obviously, um, and and doing all of that. So I was just it just fell off the radar. But I do want to do something like in an ideal scenario, I would have used it for this album, which would have been fantastic. But yeah, if I survive, maybe I'll do it. You see, if if I don't, like it might be a bloodbath next week. Who knows? Shit, Incredible. dude. Yeah, it's going to be a bloodbath. It's going to be a roast. I can't wait to hear about it. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> oh. You're going to crush. You're going to crush. I wish I were going to be there. It sucks. I just want to, you know, change your strings and and uh, make it. I'm like, hey, guys, uh, you need a fresh pot of coffee? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could freaking do with so. I don't think we've got anybody uh, like there to do that. So it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, uh, I know. I know. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. All that to say, I'm going to. Yeah, we'll see what it's, what it turns out it's like. Amazing. It's going to be fun. I can't wait to hear about it. Dude, should we uh, should we say bye? Do you want to yeah. sign us off? I you always sign us off. Thank Do you, you, you so care. much for dealing with our ramblings and for listening. We have a lot of people listening right now. The best thing you could do to help us out, if you would please, is leave us a five-star review on any platform that you want. Also, when wherever you're listening to this, if you can leave comments, talk to us about what you would like to hear. Yeah. What do you want to hear us talk about? What interests you? Do you love it when we catch up? Do you hate it? Do you want more gear? Do you want more things that are more existential about how you get a gig, how you keep a gig, philosophy 
varieties of playing, right? What do you want to yeah. hear? We would love to know that. We love getting feedback about the pod, and we just have a blast. And we're moving up, and we're keeping on going. So thank you so much for listening. I have been Ian Martin Allison. This has been Scott Devine over across the pond. I'm going to come see you soon, dude, too. I'm going to be yeah, over there before you know something? it. Is he three weeks? eating crisps and chocolate. It's going to oh, be insane. It's going to be awesome, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, if great. anybody wants to sort of like give us feedback, a great place to do that is actually over on YouTube on the mm-hmm. on the podcast channel. We've got a podcast. It's called the SBL Podcast over on uh, YouTube. We've got 5,000 subscribers. Woohoo! Ow! Moving up, baby, moving I up. Know, moving up, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and and you know, like I'm just looking on this last uh, this last episode here. We've got like it was published seven days ago. There's 75 comments on there, so like loads of people pitching in and having you know been part of the discussion. Definitely go check out the last one that we've done. It's called Neck Through versus Bolt On. Um, if you haven't seen that, like. I could care less about the uh, the subject matter, honestly. What I want you to look at is Ian's hat on top of his cans in the <laughs> intro. <laughs> yeah, dude, I went for it. <laughs> you went for it. I, I went for it, dude. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I want to make that part of my look. I, th- I thought I'd get you with that. <laughs> that is the look. Honestly, I saw it a couple of weeks ago. No, like last week, I saw it. And I was like... That's heavy. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to take a screenshot and send it to you, but I completely forgot. And I just pressed uh, on. I wish my, you would have. I went on the on the SPL podcast, and your face just popped up with your hat on on top of your cans. It's awesome. <laughs> anyway, so go check that out over on uh, on YouTube, guys. And obviously, you can catch them on iTunes and stuff like that, and all of them Spotify places as well. Spotify places. That's right. All the places. Yeah. All the places. Yeah. Let's bounce, dude. It's been so fun. All right. Yeah. We'll see guys. you next time. That's it. Bye. Take care, everybody.